Dan Rabinovich, or Dan Rabinowitz, it looks like in English, but it's the same name, uh, who is a professor of sociology and anthropology at Tel Aviv University, a chairman of the Association for Environmental Justice in Israel. He was head of Tel Aviv University's Porter School of Environmental Studies and chairman of the Greenpeace Mediterranean. He received the Pratt Prize for Environmental Journalism in 2012 and the Green Globe Award for Environmental Leadership in 2016. I am delighted to let you know that he also teaches a course at the Arava Institute called Conflict and Cooperation. And his new book, The Power of Deserts, Climate Change, and Middle East, the Middle East and the Promise of Post-Oil Era is newly out there. He's going to talk to us today about 200, how can 200 uh, Arab men change climate change? So thank you very much for joining us and thank you, Don, for being with us and teaching us. Thank you very much, Miriam. Very happy to be here with uh, all of you. Looks like a nice crowd and happy that uh, this association with the uh, Arava Institute, which I'm sure has been an important part of many of your lives, has also become a part of my life. I, as Miriam said, just uh, finished teaching my first course at Arava Institute this past semester and will be uh, joining as a more permanent fellow um, from the coming academic year. I'm speaking from my office at Tel Aviv University, uh, which is where my day job is. And I'm very happy for this opportunity to uh, introduce uh, you to this new book that actually came only last week with uh, Stanford University Press. And um, I'll be talking, I guess, for about 35 minutes, something like this, to introduce the main argument. And we'll welcome Q&A and, uh, and a chat and um, a discussion. I also invite uh, all of you who are interested to be in touch with me directly. Let me share the screen to this presentation, which also has my, um, my, my email address and um, and, and I just want to just say one thing as the talk goes on, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and I will field them and ask Dan or ask you to ask Dan as we go on. Thank All you. Right. So here go, here, here goes. My um, talk today actually comes in three parts. The first part will be familiar, I think, to many of you and will be quite short. It's, it's if you like, the good news, um, the energy transition from uh, fossil fuels to renewables has begun. Um, and it is progressing in the general direction that the environmental movement has been advocating for uh, over the last 40 years. Second part would basically say that, if you like, the bad news is that the transition has started too late and is progressing too slow. Uh, and the race against time to avoid climate chaos is uh, on. Um, but we may be losing it. The third part is really where I get to um, the main argument of the book, and that is that the oil-rich kingdoms of the Persian Gulf may be in a unique position right now to accelerate this transition and thus maybe help and uh, save the climate. So um, I'll start by talking about the energy transition that has begun. Um, coal is the easiest. It began its global decline about 10 years ago. In 2017, as you can see, it was still accounting for about 43% of greenhouse gas emissions. But look what happened to it in 2020, partly because of the COVID, part, partly because of other things. Um, it, you could say that the fuel that led the industrial revolution of the 19th century has more or less uh, run, its, uh, run its course. You can uh, see it in another way when you um, look at a year by year um, use of coal. And so each year compares the use of coal to the previous year. Again, look at 2019 and 2020. The trend there is uh, pretty clear. And another indication, uh, the fuel mix for electricity in Britain 
if you look at the left of this uh, um, of this uh, slide, you will see that uh, in 1990, about 50 percent of the power in, in in Britain was produced from coal. Compare it to 2019, where it's about five percent. Five percent. So uh, we can really see that um, coal is, 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 is a matter of the past, more or less, in every part of the world. But if we look at oil, oil um, is a different story. It is changing also, but slower. Um, so like oil and gas, the two fossil fuels which propelled the 20th century and the early 21st century, um, uh, and which in 2017 still accounted for about 50% of greenhouse gas emission is also declining, not as dramatically as coal, but the trend is, is, is there. This slide is a reminder of the demand for oil by sectors uh, of the global economy. You can see transportation, of course, is very, very dominant. Um, um, it is the main source of demand, but we know where transportation is going right now. It's going there, and it's going there, and it's going even there and there. Um, so uh, by 2025, all major car producers will have either hybrid or fully electric models on the road. By 2030, you uh, will be hard pressed to buy a new car with a traditional internal combustion engine. Um, in aviation, this, the process is progressing much slower. Uh, it uh, accounts for about 8% of pre-COVID-19 demand for oil globally. Uh, so the process will take longer, but hydrogen and solar powered prototypes um, already um, exist. Um, and uh, so, so oil demand will go down in aviation too. Even in heavy, heavy industry, uh, we see a move in, in, in the same direction. Um, Bill Gates' Heliogen um, um, project transforms sunlight into concentrated solar energy with temperatures greater than 1,000 degrees Celsius. This could replace fossil fuels in critical industrial processes, including the production of cement, steel, uh, petrochemicals. Um, so that would dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions from these activities as well. Um, so uh, this is this this uh, picture is from Lancaster, California, and um, we can see that things are, are happening there. Uh, and also, as uh, when we look at power generation, um, the, the the trend is 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 quite clear. Um, we uh, see more and more power all over the world being produced from uh, solar sources. Um, you can look at, for example, the fact that in, in 2019, the, EU, the, the EU no longer subsidizes, not, doesn't need to subsidize most types of renewable um, uh, energy. Uh, the, 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 the figure um, for, on the left where it says EU is the amount of electricity and in the EU in general produced from, from alternative sources. And then you can see a country by country um, uh, account with um, important countries like uh, like Germany and, and, and others well into the 20s, sometimes even up to the 30s and, and 40s. So there is a transformation of, uh, of, of power production into solar. Uh, this is a, a, a look to, to, to the future um, and estimate that by 2050, we could have 65% um, um, uh, of, of all electricity uh, um, energy consumed coming from renewable sources. So this this is why we say that the, that this uh, um, uh, the um, revolution has started, and it of course is driven by a dramatic revolution in the price of rene renewable energy, energy, more than ninety percent drop uh, in a decade. Uh, which you can see here, if you look at the, uh, at the, at the brown, uh, golden brown line that starts at 359, 359 dollars per megawatt electricity was the price you had to pay in uh, about 10 years ago if you wanted to produce solar um, electricity from solar sources. 
Look where it is now. It is around $20 per megawatt. And no other fuel uh, has, uh, has changed so dramatically and has gone down. Some of them have even become more expensive. So this is really the, the, the great transformation that is underwriting this, uh, this process that, that, that we are talking about. Um, even in the United States, uh, the two uh, green um, tabs that are surrounded by blue are conventional uh, ways of, of producing um, of power in turbines and in, uh, with uh, types of coal. Uh, this is a projection for 2025 and you see that the five bars on the left, which represent solar and wind and the combined cycle and geothermal are all cheaper. Uh, than uh, conventional ways. Uh, this is a projection for 2025. Um, so this, of course, will have um, tremendous global implications for uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, um, if, you, if you look at this graph for a moment, you will see that this, uh, th this represents uh, how much of the total 35 billion tons of CO2 that were emitted to the atmosphere in, in 2016, how much of it came from the various sectors. And of course, electricity is, and heat is, is at the top there with 14 billion tons, that's 43%. 40, Transport is second with uh, 20, 22%. Uh, percent. And, um, and we can see that if transportation goes electric, which it is, and if electricity production goes renewable and mainly solar, which it is also, then between these two sectors, uh, we could have up to 65% of greenhouse gas emissions largely expunged. Uh, throw in a bit of electrification also and solarification in industry, in agriculture, in building, uh, and this figure could realistically reach 70 or even 80% of all emissions. So on the whole, we can say that we're looking at a op optimistic, um, view. This is why I said we could start with the good news. But um, is it happening fast enough? This is where we start thinking about it a little bit more um, critically uh, and with more concern. Is this thing going to happen fast enough? Um, and I think you will agree with me that the answer so far is a resounding no. Um, the reason is uh, the sophisticated and deeply entrenched, and I think most robust regime of subsidies for fossil fuels that exists in many places around the world. It is so deeply embedded in our economy that many of us can no longer uh, notice it. Um, you can think about the carbon subsidy regime as having different forms in different countries. In some places, it's the low royalties uh, for fossil fuel extraction. Some others, it's tax incentives for prospectors, uh, infrastructure freebies that goes from government to fossil fuel producers, reduced taxes on energy intensive industries, um, subsidized fuel and, and electricity for consumers is a type of, uh, of subsidy and uh, of course industry bailouts uh, and, and, and much more. Um, my favorite um, metaphor to describe this, uh, this problem that we are on a good road but not progressing uh, quickly enough um, is, is this and I'm quoting from, uh, from the power of deserts. Uh, our collective journey towards renewables is like a train, but having left the station to climb a wooden mountain is engulfed by a forest fire. The passengers fear for their lives. The engine driver frantically searches the manual for protocols that might enable the train to reach the top unharmed and turn downhill away from the inferno. The fortunes of the train will be determined by how rapidly the fire spreads, but also by the steepness of the slope. Pushing the fable to its limits, the gradient this metaphoric train is struggling against reflects the intensity of the regime of subsidies, which holds fossil fuels afloat 
even as the market turns against them. Buttressed by denial and false statements, this regime dispenses grants and tax breaks, incentives and concessions to some of the wealthiest, most irresponsible corporations the world has ever known. Which brings me to the Persian Gulf and if you like the main thrust of the power of deserts. Um, we're talking about mainly about the six oil rich countries on the western rim of the Persian Gulf known as the GCC six. GCC is the Gulf Cooperation Council which they established in the 1980s mainly to coordinate the production and marketing of oil and gas better amongst them. And in many ways, the GCC-6 uh, make the backbone of OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. The most dominant amongst them, of course, is Saudi Arabia. It's also biggest and most populous. Um, but the other five, um, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, uh, United Arab Emirates, and Oman are, are also there. Um, and they are important because to begin with, they are, uh, if you see them on the left in the brown, they account for 28% of um, oil production around the world. Um, they also account for 29% of known reserves. Um, if you look at the top 10 oil producers of the world, you'll find three of them there. Saudi Arabia is on the left, number two. Um, United Arab Emirates is there, uh, fourth from the right. Kuwait is there. The other three, Bahrain, uh, Oman, um, um, and um, Qatar, are in the, still in the top 20, but not in the top 10. Um, so uh, they're important because they make such a big chunk of oil, oil, um, produce, oil and gas produced today. And of course, uh, oil and gas have been responsible for one of the most dramatic feats of growth the world has ever seen. Uh, look at Abu Dhabi, which is one of the Emirates, one of the seven Emirates that is part of the United Arab Emirates. Abu Dhabi in 1966 had 30 motor cars. Uh, its first paved road came in 1968. Uh, today it has uh, 1.4 million cars uh, roaming its super, super, super highways. Um, if you look at the country at large, the United Arab, Arab Emirates at large, uh, it grew from a thousand cars in 1965 to more than three million uh, cars today. Um, energy consumption, if you want another measure for the tremendous and, and very, very quick growth, um, uh, energy consumption per capita grew fivefold since 1973 in the United Arab Emirates. There's no other country in the world that has seen this um, uh, going that quickly. The overall um, gross domestic uh, production uh, in, uh, in, in all of these countries has been very, very large. The, the figure that you see here next to the bars representing the countries is the average annual growth from in, for the last, uh, in, the, in the 40 year period between 1973 to 2014. So for 40 years, they had an annual uh, growth, which uh, for most of them was around seven or eight percent, very, very high. In the case of Qatar, even, even, even bigger, 12 percent. Um, if you look at how uh, the, the uh, domestic uh, production has grown uh, over that same period, cumulatively from 1973 to 2014, you can see that um, the United Arab Emirates uh, grew 138. Their economy grew by a factor of 138 in these 40 years. Saudi Arabia by, by a factor of 50. Germany and the United States, which of course also grew in the same period, grew at a completely different uh, and, and much lower rate. Um, so uh, we're looking at, um, the, the end of oil, if you like, and, the, uh, and, and we're looking at, uh, at, at, at a process that is, that is happening and which will have particular um, meaning um, for, uh, for these oil producing countries because 
since so much of their growth and so much of their um, uh, of their prosperity is um, uh, is is based on uh, on oil and gas, there is a real danger that what will happen to them in the 21st century will be the same as happened to salt in the 19th century. And what do I mean by this? These are pictures from abandoned salt, salt mines in Europe that were turned into museums. Salt was used extensively in pre-modern times for meat preservation and became, was of course very valuable because of that. In medieval France and 16th century Poland, for example, salt taxes triggered invasions and displacements and migrations and wars. Um, military strategy in the American War of 1812 was partly shaped by a desire to control salt supplies. British policies in, in India in the 19th century at certain junctures were determined by salt. But then in the late 19th century, industry and manufactured ice followed by um, mass produced electrical refrigerators um, became prevalent in depots, shops, and eventually also in private homes. And this transformed uh, the meat storage and changed the food trade forever. Demand for salt was decimated and uh, the desirable commodity uh, of yesteryear became almost redundant. Um, tycoons uh, who once had wielded power over kings and princes drifted very quickly to, uh, to obscurity. So we can see how this energy transformation that, 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 that we described earlier could have a, a far reaching um, consequences for any oil producing countries, but mainly for the oil producing countries in the Gulf who have very little else other than oil and gas. Now the other peril um, that is, uh, um, uh, th that is uh, uh, looming over them is of course climate change. This is a map of the Middle East with uh, parts in red highlighted as uh, the, the warmer desert uh, climates. Uh, you, you can see that the, the whole of the Middle East is, 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 is pretty hot in terms of the kind of climates, but of course the red parts are, uh, are particularly, um, sensible, uh, uh, particularly hot and particularly vulnerable for, for climate change. Um, have a look at uh, a closer look of, uh, uh, of the Gulf and you can see the reason why the Gulf uh, itself and especially the, the western and northern rims of the Persian Gulf are so vulnerable. Um, you can see that to the south um, there is uh, this ridge of mountains of Oman which I'm following here with my cursor uh, about 10,000 feet high sorry this uh, went too quickly. Um, let me see if I can go back. I'm not sure because I'm not in full control here of the. Uh, anyway, uh, what I, I'll, I'll describe it uh, that, that this this uh, ten thousand foot ridge protruding north from from uh, uh, near Oman to the Straits of Hormuz separates the Gulf from the cooling effect of the Indian Ocean. And to the east, you have an even higher mountain ridge of Shiraz in Iran, uh, which does the same. So the result is that the Gulf uh, is, a, it is, is a depression surrounded by mountain ridges from all sides. And it becomes a heat and humidity trap, which creates extremely harsh conditions. Uh, the, the current slide shows you uh, one aspect of it. Uh, look at the average uh, temperature in Kuwait in the summer. Uh, observed in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. The average daily temperature in July and August is 37 degrees centigrade. This is the average daily. It's not the average top. It's the average between night and day, which implies that uh, daily temperatures are probably averaging around 43, 44, and night temperatures go, go down to about 30 or 29. You can see also the, 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 rain, the, the rainfall figures um, uh, on, on, on the left. And if you look at the next one, you will see the projection for the future. 
so the projection of the future is the difference from, from now, according to the month. And if you look again to August and September, you would see that the prediction is that it's going to be six or even seven degrees um, hotter than it is today, which translates to 42.5, um, which translates to a daily high on average, not uh, on, on, on extremely hit, hot days, but on average of 50. Uh, and the, the range goes up to uh, eight or nine uh, degrees high, uh, higher than today, which would bring us to a daily average of 45 degrees with daily highs regularly going up to um, 52.5. These are Dan, true. Can I, can I interrupt you for a second? I think that the question that's percolating in what you're saying and the question that uh, is percolating actually from some of our folks in, on Facebook and uh, on the question is how does Oh, so we understand that they like like Israel right now. This week has been crazy hot, uh, and the rest of the world is experiencing more hotter temperatures, and that will not only make people hotter and more uncomfortable, but it also is bringing around um, social distress, around drought and migrations, uh, Syrian civil war, Africa. They expect a lot of uh, heat and climate change migration. Sounds like you've read the book, this, Miriam. Excuse me. How will this motivate our uh, new friends and, and frenemies in the Gulf states to consider um, climate change as a motivator for themselves when we know oil and gas produce money for them and wind and solar, which they could adapt in their local environments, is not a quote a cash crop. So how will this? How can this well, translate? Well, great. Thanks, Miriam. Uh, I want to commend you twice. Once because by integrating the, the, the question, which as you say is percolating and, and and may have been present in the chat. I'm not. I'm not following the chat. You, in many ways, uh, summarize the first part of the book. Which I, which, which, which made me suspe suspicious that maybe you've already read it, even though it's only a week old. Not yet, but clearly I'm like, you know, mentally yes. sharing with you. But, but this is very much the case, including uh, inequality across the Middle East because of uh, because of the climate change, and because of its implications, and, uh, and 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 insecurity. And Sudan is in the book, and 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 Syria is in the book, and so on. The second reason why I want to commend you is that because you set up the uh, the, the main questions which I'm going to answer uh, momentarily, and that is, what does this double trouble on the on the Gulf? Uh, what what does it mean, and how will will it change uh, uh, things uh, on the ground? So the double trouble we're talking about, of course, is post-oil and its economic implication and the post-normal climate era, which is coming up. It creates a sense of urgency in the kingdoms by the Gulf about their future and could perhaps, and this is where I'm coming to the question that Miriam posed, drive them to help themselves in ways that might also help others. Um, and let me explain. Besides oil and gas, the kingdoms um, by the Gulf have not much else in terms of natural resources, but they have one thing uh, which, is, which they are also beginning to awaken to, and that is sunshine. Um, in terms of solar radiation, it's one of the richest places on the, on the on planet. Um, 300 sunny days a year, and over 2,000 kilowatt hour per meter square per year, which is very high. I don't want to bore you with the, with the figures, but it's, uh, it's, it's an average figure that is almost uh, double the, 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 global, the global figure. Um, the areas in red here represent places that are 80 to 100% suitable for solar energy because they have so much solar irradiation, um, few particles in the air, and other conducive um, circumstances. For example, their nearness to centers of population. Not any part of the desert where you can have solar panels is 
100% suitable for, uh, for solar panels, but if it's also near to a center of consumption, then it, 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 raises, it raises the bar. Um, they, so they have lots of, lots of sunshine. Second, they have an abundance of unproductive land uh, because they don't have so much water. There's so much land that is uh, not useful. Third, they have available capital, which has been accumulated during the last 50 years of uh, prosperity and abundance because of the, uh, oil, the age of oil and gas. Uh, and, and fourth, they have an impressive record of incorporating innovation into civil infrastructure. They are not very big on innovation themselves, but they know how to integrate innovation um, into their civil infrastructure. These, are, these, these pictures are from, um, from Abu Dhabi, from Masdar City, which is a campus built uh, partic particularly for a new innovation, including uh, uh, solar energy and, and, other, and, and other things. So they have these four things, sun, land, money, and uh, the capacity to innovate integration going for them, um, which could make solar energy a very central part of their economy and of their future. Um, the, their record so far has been relatively poor. Look at the fourth uh, column from the right, that's the important one, the share of renewable energy in total electricity capacity is very low. It's not really uh, 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 impressive at all for um, tw tw 2017, 2018. It's, uh, in Saudi Arabia, it's only 0.2 of a percent. Uh, the rest of the area also under 1%. The only country that has done something in this direction is the United Arab Emirates at 2%. Uh, and they are, they've almost doubled it since uh, 2018 and, and counting. So their uh, record has not been um, very impressive. You can see it also here, the top, very thin green line at the top represents how much of their um, uh, uh, electricity uh, is, uh, is produced by uh, alternative and renewable energy, very, very low as you can see. And, um, uh, but on the other hand, um, they, uh, uh, while their investment rate in renewables so far has also been below the global average, for the last 15 years they have been declaring repeatedly that they have the intention to diversify their economy away from oil, to reduce their dependence on oil, and to push their local energy markets more and more towards uh, renewables. And significantly, the numbers are now conducive for this. Um, again, look at the, only in the, at the, at the right-hand side. This is the, this is, these are results of tenders uh, by uh, the electricity companies of the various countries. You can see the countries on the left. And these are the prices that they are now paying the companies that, that, uh, that produce electricity for them. And you can see that the, pr the prices, especially of the solar, solar PV, like as you can see, for example, here, at this particular uh, power station is very low. It's going down to 2.4 cents per watt, which is about $24 for, for a megawatt. So the, the, the numbers are starting to accumulate in the right direction. Uh, here's another indication. The two bars on the left represent solar energy and the others represent uh, traditional energy. And you can see that the bottom, the bottom uh, margin of, uh, of solar energy is now lower Dan, Dan, I'm going to, I'm going to, this is a great detail, but I want to kind of bring us back up to the, to the big, big problem, which is, right. you know, this is not an export that they can export. We, we, we can barely store solar. Uh, I, I'm always looking for the investment in the pure play in the perfect solar storage, let alone export it. So uh, we're, we're, though they might give up Though they might use solar for themselves, it does not be replace the source of cash and income that uh, oil and gas is provided. And so how do they, do we think they would have ever have the instinct to become a force for solar change or for change uh, on a more global scale? And- There's the question. There, well, there's the question, they? Miriam, and it's up on the slide right now. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm, and I'm really wrapping up now with, 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 this, with, this, with this concept. 
-huh. So the 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 six countries of the of the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, are led by approximately 200 men. Uh, each of them, each, each of these countries, is run by a monarch, surrounded by two or three dozens uh, of members of a governing or legislative council, mostly family members. So I say, what if, in the interest of self-preservation, these men decided? to first of all, accelerate their own transformation to renewables, which is easy, and they've been saying that that's what they want to do. But secondly, start invest heavily in renewable capacity and in technology globally. Um, and, um, uh, and, and then at the right moment, when they have secured, say, 25 or 30 percent of the global renewable energy market, they coordinate and orchestrate between them a dramatic reduction of their own oil and gas production, dropping the global supply by 25 or 30 percent, which is what they are worth. Um, such a disruption will force prices up a little bit, not dramatically because demand by then will be quite low of oil, but still it will push it up a little bit, enough to finally position renewables as the cheapest and safest and most attractive form of energy. Uh, and the GCC will then be able to cash in on their earlier investment in renewables. And they will have used their market power in the energy market of today which is still dominated by oil and gas, to create a similarly dominant position in the energy market of the future, where renewables uh, reign supreme. And this, as this slide suggests, could shorten the transition to renewables by perhaps a decade, maybe a little bit more. I refer you back to this race against time in which we are now involved. It will give the international community a boost in the race against time to curb global warming, and it will secure the Gulf a place on the right side of history, uh, a welcome change for a culture which has been vilified and denigrated for, for decades now. I want to, to, uh, to, 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 to end this rather counterintuitive suggestion that they would bring the end of the oil and gas um, uh, era by themselves by reminding you of uh, William Durant. Uh, William Durant was America's lead, leading carriage maker in the late 19th century. He was a millionaire at 30 and a pillar of society on the East Coast. When motor cars came along in the 1890s, he objected. He said they were noisy and smelly and dangerous. And he joined citizens protests that demanded uh, string, more stringent uh, government uh, regulation on motor cars. He didn't even allow his daughter to, to ride in a car. But then in 1903, the penny dropped. He realized that the horseless carriage was here to stay and decided on a change. Of course, he declared that he will build himself a motor car that would be so silent and so safe and clean that nobody will ever need government intervention uh, again. Um, he bought a company in trouble in Flint, Michigan called Buick, which was in debt. He then joined hands with Henry Chevrolet, Chevrolet and created General Motors. Um, and you could say that the rest is history. Um, he, by the way, was not the only one. There is an Australian uh, company called Holden, which started in 1856 as saddle makers. Uh, and you could say the same about the Studebaker brothers. So in all these cases, we see people who were carriage builders, but at some point stopped, stopped looking at themselves as expertise, experts in carriage and thought about experts expertise in transportation. And in a way, what I'm suggesting for the GCC is to do the same and start thinking about themselves, not so much as oil people, but as energy people, and to um, use the wealth and the leverage that they have gained in the last 50 years when oil and gas was selling so high in order to really protect themselves from a future that could really bring them 
um, um, very, very bad news. Um, I think okay, that gonna, the I'm gonna. I think um, that, I, I'm oh. about to finish. I'm about okay. to finish. So just let me uh, uh, sure, sure. do the last bit. Um, I think that the trajectory that I'm describing here, uh, whereby those most associated with oil and climate uh, obstruction suddenly become champions of renewables is credible mainly because it doesn't assume a change of heart or an ideological transformation on their part. Rather, it takes greed and thirst for power, objectionable as they are, for granted. And it suggests that the choices open for the kingdoms by the Gulf in the post-oil era, which also coincides with the post-normal climate era, could, could make the change. Um, before coronavirus, the notion that 200 conservative, despotic Arab men could play an active role in stopping climate change was as counterintuitive as was the view in, say, early 1989, that Gorbachev would undo the Soviet Union or Mandela would emerge from prison to nullify apartheid and reinvent South Africa. But here we are um, with a nagging feeling that the current reality in the Gulf, where heat is still just bearable and petrodollars flow with ease and dynasties look stable, uh, could be short-lived. So, um, so has the time come, come for the kingdoms by the Gulf to have a change of heart uh, regarding energy? These are actually the closing lines uh, of the book. And I leave you with this um, image um, and, 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 and say that this is actually a more difficult choice than it looks. I mean, I think I can guess where your moral inclination takes you uh, between uh, Greta Thunberg and um, uh, MBS, by which of the two is better suited for undoing the Gordian knot which keeps us from preventing climate chaos? Um, I'm not suggesting a definitive answer um, to close the argument, um, but I think that it opens a, a different debate. Thank you. Thank you for listening so far. Thank you, Dan. Um, I think there's two kinds of questions and I'm going to centralize one. I'm gonna also, uh, Bob, I'm gonna call on you in a couple of seconds, but let me ask one other question before I do. One of the big questions that people have uh, asked here is about consumption. Uh, you know, China and India are big, huge consumers. Um, energy in its current forms beyond oil and gas are very hard to transport, um, converting uh, solar or wind or anything else into something transportable or even storable, as we know, is really problematic. How do we see China and India and other huge consumers of, not to mention the United States, um, moving their consumption patterns? Corona gave the world a little bit of a pause in a bunch of these areas, but it's not going to be static. Um, is is Greta the you know do we have to to rely on the on the the young people to move us on to the consumption side and uh, how do we see China and India and other power brokers uh, Russia included playing in this game? So thanks for this question and thanks again for sort of integrating some of the uh, some of the points raised in the chat. Um, I think that uh, um, China and India are, are actually, uh, uh, I wouldn't put them apart from other parts of the world. It is true that their consumption levels are going up and going up very steeply, but both of them are also very much uh, at the cutting edge of, of the energy transformation. Uh, true, both of them have lots of coal, and uh, you could say that you could see say that the last bastion of this falling empire of coal are in East Asia, but I think in the, in terms of other things, uh, the Chinese will be driving the same cars that all of us do in ten years, and these and these cars would be predominantly uh, electric. 
And the Chinese are very, very strong on solar energy, both on the production of the PV panels themselves, which they lead the world by leaps and, and bounds, but also in terms of uh, the effort, the technological effort for storage, which is a big, big issue. Uh, production of energy from solar panels is, uh, is easy, but storing it, for example, for nighttime or for, or for cloudy days is, is a problem, but this is something that is, that is happening. And in fact, um, uh, India's high-tech industry is, is highly involved and so is, is, is China. So I think that if we, if you remember that slide where I showed the, the estimate that in uh, 2050 or 2060, 65% of power all around the world will be produced from solar. I, I see India and China both in the 65%, but also in the 35 remaining percent because of the coal. Um, so yes, we are looking at these challenges, but, uh, but I do think that the, energy transformation uh, train has left the station. Great. Bob, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. I know you've been engaged in some interesting conversations about UAE and also I know you're up to date on energy questions. So take it away. Give us a question right there. We're done. Well, really, my, uh, Dan, I really appreciate your argument that the economics and the drive to power will cause people to do things which may be unconventional in the future. So I completely get that. Uh, the question is, do we need to wait for only these people in the Gulf Economic Council to be first movers? Or can somebody outside, in the chat you'll see people have been saying, what if there was a partnership with China? Um, what if there was the way to ship something produced with the photovoltaics uh, to concentrate something that would be shippable and send that to Europe or South America or North America? So I guess my real question is, have you looked at partnerships, international financing, which could cause something to really change in the next five years. And that's my question. I put a lot of links in the chat about press coverage of both Abu Dhabi and Saudi Arabia's bid processes. They've invited international companies to do gigawatt scale photovoltaics in the next two to three years. You probably know about those deals. Yes, they were in the slides that I showed up with the tender. Right. The, te the tenders were the results of this. This is an excellent point, point, Bob. I will answer directly by saying, I don't think that our only hope is the GCC6. I'm, I'm, I'm not deterministic about it. I think that if other very major oil producers including the United States and Russia and, and, and Brazil and South Africa and others, uh, decide to go in the same direction, uh, there could be a contribution from them as, as well. What I am saying is that in the particular case of the GCC6, we have this intersection of circumstances that really leave them very little choice. Other oil producers are not as dependent on oil as they are. And other oil, oil producers, uh, Russia is probably more dependent than the United States, but large oil producers look at the future and say, okay, in 10 or 15 years, our oil will be almost worthless because there will be very little demand, but we have other options. So we are not that desperate now to substitute this income with something else. In the case of the GCC, they really have very little, little, very few other options. They have the money sitting now but, and they could invest it in, in various places and they, and they have actually started doing that. But I think that they are our best bet in the sense that the urgency of both the post oil economics and the post normal climate era is, is most likely to push them rather than, than, than other players. I would be delighted uh, with any other major player in the oil and gas industry thinking in the same way and coming to the same conclusion 
and proactively joining this uh, energy transformation as I think that they could and I think they, 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 they also should. I can tell you that, um, uh, uh, that uh, I've, I've had an um, interesting meeting with, with, with one of the ministers in the Israeli government uh, this past week, exactly ab about the, these kind of partnerships that you're talking about. Um, and I think that uh, certainly in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the context of the new relationship between Israel and the United Arab Emirates and, and possibly of other GCC countries, um, uh, Israel would probably seek to, to become uh, a broker uh, or part of these, uh, of these, uh, of these new partnerships. Um, for example, Israel is not a leading, uh, a leading country in the world in terms of renewable energy in total. Uh, we only produce about 10% of, uh, or 11% of our um, uh, electricity from renewables now, which is okay, but it's nothing to be proud of. But if you only look at the portion of solar uh, in the alternative, then Israel is number two or three in the world. We produce almost 9% from solar. Other countries that produce a lot of alternative energy mainly go for wind or have gone for wind so, so far. So Israel is, is, real, is a real uh, world leader in, in solar energy. And I'm sure that this link could tie into a, a partnership which would inc hopefully include other parties as well to create these uh, larger movement that, that I think you were referring to. Don, I'm going to thank you for your time, your attention, the depth of your insight on this matter. Uh, thank you for writing the book so that we can learn more and share more. And uh, we very much appreciate everyone coming and joining us. Uh, if you have other questions or questions that aren't, weren't answered, we're going to share them with Dan. And uh, he will uh, hopefully answer some of them and get back to you. If you have other questions that you want to relate to him, you are more than welcome to do so. And I'm just typing in my, uh, my email address. So if anybody you wants, you're more than welcome to be in touch. We appreciate it. And um, aren't we delighted that Dan is teaching our students at the Arava Institute and that they get the benefit of his wisdom and knowledge and um, then can take that to their homes, whether those are in Israel, Palestine, Jordan, or around the world, and spread the wisdom. Hopefully very soon that will include students from the United Arab Emirates. We're already uh, in touch and making that play. So, uh, as well as to build other relationships. Uh, so it'll be really interesting to have people from there uh, in the mix. I promise you that. Uh, thank thanks, you all. Miriam and, uh, thanks, Miriam, and I also want to thank uh, 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 Aliza and Rachel for their administrative help to make this happen. Really enjoyed it. Looking forward to, to the next time. Yes, thank you for mentioning. We have a, a mini class next week. We'll send you all the details in an email. It's about nanosatellites and climate change research. Should be really interesting. There you go. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.